Hello again, and today we have arrived at the topic of the League of Nations. So, after talking about the previous treaties of 1919, move on to the 1920s, where the interwar period was dominated by the winning powers of the Great War, in which they created a covenant a coalition of... Um, it is basically the predecessor of the UN. <laughs> anyway, so... The League of Nations, Societe des Nations. I'm gonna butcher that French. Haha. <laughs> so the Brits succeeded in pushing it to be a flexible association of all nations, not just the League of Democracies as Wilson had envisaged. Because Wilson of the US, again, that idealistic world predecessor of the world police mentality, we must need democracy and freedom and all that stuff and it's only governed by the victors and whatnot, the Brits actually were like, no, it's actually not fair. We must include as many countries as we can. So they did kind of, it is a League of Nations, but it's controlled by the victors in the end. The League's covenant was included in all five treaties signed between, the, between 1919 and 1920. Germany and its allies were excluded membership until they kind of reapplied for admission to the human race and they just uh, joined up when they demonstrated that they weren't um, kind of uh, dangerous anymore. And it did seem like a victor's club of the First World War because the permanent members, they got veto power and only they had the veto power. So basically any other country that uh, proposes something that, the one, that any permanent member does not comply with, they can just say no. The US never joined. This bit is very important because it's sort of like the downfall as I've said many many times before. No army, no resources and no money and whatever so you can't have a peacekeeping force. Austria was to accept war guilt, pay reparations and it limit its armed forces to 30,000 men. That's nothing compared to Germany's restrictions. Much of the nation's territory is given to Italy given that they were fighting against them on the Italian front. Her population went from 22 million to 6.5 million. That's very deadly and had lost industrial areas. Basically, like over half of the population was killed. Bulgaria was to play... Uh, sorry, not killed. I mean, uh, under uh, half, over half, over 60% of the population was gone. Or well, more than 60% actually. It's like close to 75% of the... Uh, uh, nearly 75% of the uh, original population had been either killed or given to Italy under Italian jurisdiction. Bulgaria was to pay reparations, have her armed forces limited to 20,000 and she lost territories obviously. Unfortunately, the territory that Hungary lost was extremely resource heavy like coal and oil. Her population was reduced from 21 million to 7.5 million after giving away the territory and the Dardanelles were made an international shipping port, so no more Gallipoli invasions and stuff. Turkey lost territory uh, to Greece, small states and mandates, so basically the Ottoman Empire was chopped up. And following a nationalist revolt, uh, Enver Pasha or something, and then a war against Greece, the Treaty of Sevres was revised to be fairer against the Turks. So, um, given that they had a revolt and uh, things were not going well in Turkey, they decided the League of Nations decided to be lenient. So as we can see this map here of the chopping up of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. The TOV helped to form the nationalist movement in Spain that, as in, sorry, in Germany was that was to go on to support Hitler, because the 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 extreme limitations placed by the treaty, the diktat, and the resentment against the uh, the Weimar government that signed the treaty that was humiliating and just basically destroyed German economy and induced all these very bad social problems. So it's the lesser of both evils, I guess for Hitler because yeah he's extreme but he does promise to break what the people hate so yeah <laughs> the people blamed Weimar for signing the arms yep as, as I've just said that and even before Hitler in the 1920s German politicians were committed to recovering land lost to Poland for example Stresemann recognized Germany's western borders in the 25 Locarno pact but would not do to her eastern borders because the Germans some of them were like they insisted on maintaining German prestige the reparation payments, as I've mentioned before, destabilized Germany, but it was only this bad because she responded so poorly, because she wasn't even able to pay the reparations. 
All countries were in debt to each other and mostly to the U.S. credit loaner because the various countries saw their ability to pay back the U.S. as dependent on Germany paying her reparations to the Allies, given that the U.S. had emerged as the leading superpower with money, resources and whatever. Uh, loaning, lo loaning money is not the U.S.'s first, it won't be the, first, won't be the last time the U.S. loaned stuff to Allied nations, cough, cough, lend, lease, World War II. So the U.S. lent to Germany to support her to support her after the Ruhr crisis in which the French took the Ruhr because Germany couldn't pay up and didn't pay up Germany became dangerously dependent on US loans so when the Wall Street crash happened in 29 uh, it wrecked the global economy hard for 10 years unemployment, hyperinflation, social unrest and Germany nationalism on the rise did I mention unemployment? yes I did so anyway Turkey went to war with Greece in 20 to 23 and won and the Allies didn't strike back because they didn't have uh, force. They didn't have uh, a, a, a league, uh, a League of Nations uh, uh, standing army, a police force, a peace force to defend the peace treaties, which was ironic given that they had an army of occupation in Germany. So yeah, concessions were made to the Turkish Republic in the Treaty of Luzon, and the Italians were angry because they had a mutilated victory previously. The nationalist anger, the mutilated victory, helped to propel Mussolini into power fascism, like screw you all, we guys are good and you guys scammed us. And the British intervention in the Russian Civil War helped some states remain independent from Russian rule, along with the Americans, don't forget, helping the white Russians. You see this picture here with the, is it the Putilov armored car or something? And then we've got loads of like Russians, uh, white Russians in uh, with uh, Mosin Nagant. Moist nuggets! The worldwide revolution failed, unfortunately, for the communists. So Stalin promoted socialism in one country, which led to the postponement of the international revolution until the USSR modernized. So this made the USSR diplomatically isolated because they became the first communist country and the League of Nations weren't really sure what to do with them. And as a result, both the USSR and Germany were outcasts, and so they clung to one another for mutual, not mutual support, but mutual recognition in times of isolation. So, uh, it doesn't go much into the treat, into the various, like, events that the League did, like Allen Islands and whatever, but uh, it's like a general overview to get you into the thinking of this topic. So, well, it's a bit brief, but thanks for watching anyway, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!